to me, food is everything. It's everything that I do. It's how I live my life. It's how I organize my life. It's, it's, uh, it's how I find joy. It's, you know, it's how I deal with sad moments and happy moments. Um, it's how I make sense of the world. Yeah, you come here. Yeah, two cocktails, twelve, please. Two thousand ten was an amazing year. It was the first time we were crowned the world's best restaurant. But at the end of two thousand ten, I was starting to feel doubtful about the whole situation. So the more successful we become, the the less sort of free and creative we were. The more and more we became restricted. In an 85, 90 hour work week. And who wants to go through that if you're not, you know, enjoying it? I had to do something. I had to figure out why are so many days becoming bad? Why are there so many bad days when you have everything to be happy about? I was so embarrassed. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell my wife about the journal. Because I thought it was like, who writes a journal? You know, it's like Justin Bieber fans. It ended up being a decision of coming home every night and distilling the day. And understanding the process of our creativity and what makes a good day good and a bad day bad. The journal was a quest to tame our creativity or figure out where does it come from? and what fucks it up, you know? And what makes it really good? Through writing this journal, in a year, seeing the thread of things, that, that made me make very new decisions for my restaurant and for myself, you know, as a creative being. It just changed things completely. Getting to be unafraid again, that's very important. There's nothing to lose, I'm just myself. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but we're gonna go crazy until somebody says stop, you know? Do some 
So, uh, let's see what I've written down here. Uh, chef. I wrote the word chef down. Uh, you hear that word kicked around quite a bit in, the, in these circles, chef. So I actually uh, was curious to see what that, um, what that meant. So I went on uh, Wikipedia. And chef, let's see here, it says, chef is somebody who cooks professionally for people. Um, so that's my introduction. I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, so um, I would like to throw out there that maybe uh, Renee does just a little bit more than that. Uh, I think that would be, as we say, rather limited. Um, I would uh, like to even throw out there that uh, Renee is a, it's an artist who creates and that uh, he doesn't just cook, he, um, he, he doesn't just execute, he creates. He's he takes food to a different place with a sense of curiosity. He goes on a journey, a journey of discovery. He goes looking for different things to do with food, foraging through the Danish countryside. Doesn't that sound romantic? <laughs> foraging, what, foraging through what Denmark has to offer, both on land and in the water surrounding Denmark. And the foraging part, when you tell the story of Rene and when you tell the story of Noah, that is really, um, a big, big thing. We were actually um, trying to figure out back then a few minutes ago what the word foraging actually, what it is in Danish, but thankfully we have it in, in, in English and hopefully most of you guys know what it is, but it's basically, he goes looking for food sort of through the countryside, um, through the, you know, the, through Denmark, really. It's about working with what um, the earth produces, what the earth gives, and um, the story is that uh, most of what they make at Noma, most of what Rene works with is uh, gathered within 60 miles of the restaurant itself. So if you put that in, in, in perspective for a second, you know, there's nothing coming from, say, the Mediterranean, there's no olive oils, there's nothing coming from the Far East, there's no rice, it's all just uh, local ingredients. Um, and um, that's sort of become the uh, mission statement in a way. And, and if, you, if you think about that for a second, um, I don't know if anybody's been to Denmark, but there are some very uh, next level seasons there. Um, <laughs> we're trying to hang out in Denmark for a week in February, that's not a lot of fun. Uh, so basically, you know, he's, um, I guess the word stuck, he's uh, stuck with, you know, what, what, the, uh, what the earth produces and also obviously with what the waters produce. And so with four distinctly different um, seasons, um, there's lots of different things, lots of different challenges all the time, and um, obviously when you have a, a summer situation, there's one kind of flavors and the ground pumps up all these wonderful things, but in February, for instance, it's uh, a lot of root vegetables, and it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff that they go uh, looking for in the waters surrounding Denmark. So uh, the foraging part, when you tell the story of Rene and the story of part of it and hopefully he's going to talk a little bit more on that. Excuse me one more page two. <laughs> um, let's see what else we have here. Seasons. I'll give you a couple of examples of that actually from the book that, that we are promoting a book here. Remember that. So I'll read you two of what I thought were the more interesting paragraphs. Let's see. Wednesday, March 9th, the guys started with carrots and spent weeks wrapping their heads around this one plant. Seeing where the journey would take them, they studied books and examined different species, seeds, growing areas, and conditions to learn how these affected the sugar content and every other facet of the carrot. End quote. Take that with you. Uh, and that was just March 9th. On uh, February 17th, uh, quote, it occurs to me that one of the constant themes of winter year in and year out is waste. Because we have so little to work with, what we throw in the bin causes us real pain. All the guys in the test kitchen perked up when I said, trash cooking people. I'm not saying this as a joke anymore. Why don't we let it steer us? A project where we build dishes out of the refuge that would normally find its way to the dumpster. Vegetable peelings, meat trimmings, things like that. I think those two uh, diary entries give you a, a kind of uh, an idea of, of what Rene thinks in terms of outside the box, beyond the boundaries, and, and kind of bringing a, a different set of challenges upon himself, 
on staff at Nolan and also on his uh, Ronnie Dinos and the customer. So all this is about thinking outside the box, like I said, about you know being an artist, challenging oneself, reinventing everything that, that has, you know, this is not a, I don't know if you look at it, the iPhone that I have in my left pocket, uh, it's probably gonna look very much like the one I have in my pocket 10 years from now, but we're dealing here with something that's been going on for decades, you know, centuries, millenniums, and, and I guarantee you what, what, what Renee's doing today and what Renee's gonna be doing 10 years from now will look very, very different. So this is somebody that continues to sort of reinvent himself and, and challenge the staff and all the people around him. So I think that these two quotes give a kind of an idea of, of the depth that we're talking about here. See, earlier today, as I was stumbling, I stumbled upon an interview where a gentleman from the BBC was pressing Renee hard. We talked about this interview back there earlier on why he was serving ants. This is another example of what I'm talking about. He was serving ants at Noma, if you did not know that. You have that to look forward to in your next visit. Uh, Renee looked at him without any kind of reaction and said, the thought of putting an ant in your mouth is no different than eating a shrimp. It's just a cultural thing I've discovered. It doesn't take that long for people to change. Renee is an artist. His canvas is food. His medium is food. The way he expresses himself is by creating, breaking down these barriers, inventing, and reinventing. So I'll wrap up now the longest intro ever on this tour uh, <laughs> by reading the last paragraph from the foreword that I wrote. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you the whole foreword. This is just the asset. Rene belongs to a very small group of unique creators, people who have turned their particular niches completely upside down, reinvented and redefined them, the unafraid. Whether it be Pablo Picasso or Jackson Pollock or Charlie Parker or Beatles or Francis Ford Coppola or Tarantino, James Joyce, Steve Jobs, Steve Hawkins, the list goes on and on depending on obviously who's composing it. But no matter who's on that list, or how long it is, Rene Redzepi belongs on that list and that company. Among the true pioneers because of what he has done in the last decade within the world of food. Rene is unafraid. And we are all the grateful beneficiaries of the result that his fearlessness continues to create. So without further ado, <laughs> please give up. Warm San Francisco and a warm Castro's Theater welcome. The celebrated founder, owner, chef in quotation marks, of what's been voted the number one eating establishment of this fine planet for the last three years in a row, Noma Restaurant in Copenhagen, Denmark. Please welcome Renee Vincepi. Hvor mange danskere er der? Der er mange danskere der. Fem danskere. Okay. The stage is yours. Thank you. I'll see you later. Thank you. naked right now, by the way. <laughs> Saturday the 9th of April. My body is sore, my eyes are tired, and I have a splitting headache. It was an exceptionally hard day in the kitchen today. I had several big and violent outbursts. There were loud arguments with many of the kitchen staff, and to be fucking honest, it nearly got physical. There's no room for a day on autopilot. Guests expect more, I expect more. At one point in the middle of the battle, I checked out for a second and the scene of service unfolded in front of me. Everyone was running to catch up, sweaty and dripping, their faces flushed red with exertion and heat, eyes bulging with panic. 
I was brought back when I heard a chef shouting, Chef! Chef! I burned myself! It's fucking bad! I've hot oil all over my fingers! As I watched the blisters erupt on his hand, I threw myself back into service. What a fucking crap day. This is in the top three of all time bad days. The toil of service is like an ever hungry monster that must be fed and we have to constantly push ourselves to keep one step ahead. Today, the monster caught up with us. During the post-service meeting, we looked each other in the eyes, talked about the problem, shuffled a bit in the light with our arms crossed. The silent promise was palatable. Tomorrow, let's fucking do better. And tak foi day, thank you for today, with a few high fives, a sincere way in which we should always end the day. But after a day like today, I think most of our staff ask themselves, why? Why the fuck are we here? Why have we chosen to cook for a living? I sat over the harbor having an indulgent cigarette. Who the hell once said, at the end of the day, it's just food? Monday the 7th of February. Am I okay? It's a good question, one that Nadine, my wife, posed to me on a bitterly cold day almost four months ago. Last year should have felt fucking smashing. Noma been named the world's best restaurant. I put out a book, nobody could cook from it, but it was selling really well. <laughs> we were full every day for lunch and dinner. Yet still with all that, there was Nadine one morning. Renee, you look exhausted. Are you okay? Her question sunk in as the zombie stared back at me in the mirror. Was I okay? The question lingered all day at work. I have every fucking reason to be more than perfectly okay, I reassured myself. I went to bed, but I couldn't sleep. I got up to brush my teeth and I stood with my two hands on the cold sink. I don't fucking think I'm okay. The moment I admitted this, melancholy washed over me. I didn't go to work that day. I didn't even call the restaurant. I couldn't move. I didn't feel like doing another 16-hour shift. I wasn't okay. Hello, my name is Renny Redzepi. Uh, and, uh, hello. What, what are, <laughs> I can smell popcorn. <laughs> what I just read to you was two of many, 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 many entries of my journal. I'm here to introduce this. It's called a work in progress. The heart of the, the new book is, is this, the journal. This was never meant to be a book to be published. I wrote this for myself after huh, a fairly good 2010. You know, it was, it was pretty amazing. But people were telling me after all that success that that was it. This was the mountain top. You've achieved everything. Don't switch. And I was 32. What are you supposed to do? Suddenly you have this restaurant midlife crisis. Everything was there, the Volvo, the villa, the dog, the marriage. It was like perfection. But I had never opened that restaurant for accolades. Suddenly people were telling me, that's it. You reached the top. It was an accolade. So. I took a vacation for the first time and decided I am going to write a journal. And it's true what I said up there. I was so afraid of writing this journal. I was so embarrassed. I mean, you know how kitchens are. They're full of ex-criminals and delinquents. <laughs> I can't. What was I supposed to do? Tell these guys 20 minutes before closing time, I'm leaving early, guys. I'm going to go write in my journal. <laughs> it doesn't fucking work. But I did it. And it changed our restaurant. And it changed me. And, yeah. And then my editor, she read it. And she said, this is a book. So, I'm going to read a bit from the book so you get a feel and the tone of things, the way that when I came home at night, how I was sort of thinking it. Wednesday the 16th, Thursday the 17th of February. 
2011. The frost is crippling, the wind is blowing from the east, and our dear green plants are suffocated in the snow left to die. We should have known it's like this every fucking year. And there's, a, well, as you already know, there will be lots of swearing. <laughs> The moment we convince ourselves that winter is over, it knocks us down again. The icy shards biting into our faces as we cycle to work. It just fucking pisses you off. The stupidity of everything gone wrong. Calm down, Renee, I had to tell myself. My blood was rising as I got changed and I fantasized about choking one of the damn weather gods to death. With almost no products to work with, we tried to tackle some broader concept that could somehow nudge us forward. We're searching for a way to outwit this winter. Trying to harness some of our creative processes, as this journal is meant to do, makes me reflect a bit more about how the situations we're in affect our thinking. And it occurs to me that one of the constant themes of winter, year in and year out, is waste. Because there's so little to work with, what we throw in the bin causes us real pain. We made fun of it so many times, cooking out the trash bin, trash cooking, but it was always meant to be a joke. Even though for ethical reasons, I love the idea of wasting nothing. But for it to actually become a guide to deliciousness, you have to restrain yourself, for it can take you down some unconventional paths. What would we throw in the bin, usually, you know? Not just in the bin, as in food, into the bin, but what would we throw away mentally? Lars, you enjoy this. When I say to myself, trash cooking, I mean, it sounds so stupid. We cracked. Skull after skull after skull after skull. Ah. And we stared at these brains and we poached them and we dried them. You know, we even had the idea of brain spread, but we couldn't get it right. Of course, when you are searching for new flavors and new ways of looking at things, you will inevitably fail tremendously. I just stopped thinking that there was something wrong with me all the time and the team. But this was a natural process. Like, it's a pool of failure. And the successes are the drops here and there. Wednesday, the 6th of July. More lamb heads came in today. It's a special sensation standing there with a cappuccino in your hand, your body aching and slowly coming to life, when you suddenly realize that a few hours ago, these lambs probably also had a good start to the day. <laughs> Tolston can barely look at the brains and becomes rather white and sickly as soon as they're yanked out the skull. He certainly won't taste any, which is a worrying sign, for if one of our veterans isn't game enough to try them, I wonder, are we wasting our time working with this awful? There's certainly plenty of diners who will feel the same way that he does. So we spent the day pursuing the secrets of the brains to find out how such a thing works in cooking. It turns out that brains actually contain the highest percentage of fat of any cut, and therefore they're not like other types of meat or offal, which gets firmer and sometimes drier with prolonged cooking. Brains just fall apart in an unpleasant way. And they have this funny texture somewhere between foie gras and fish sperm. And more than a few members of staff have a hard time eating them. So we decided to work with what we call a brain spread. Either served as an intermezzo in the menu, in a little warm cook cut bubbling away with different condiments next to a stack of grilled bread. Or perhaps cooked and likely squeezed into a butter ramekin so it looks as though it's about to burst out. There was even this crazy idea that we should crack the skull open, take the brain out, cook the brain, clean the cracked skull, put the cooked brain back in, 
and have the skull that's brought to the table. It was said out loud like one of those half joke, half serious things. Everybody is basically a bunch of weirdos. So the first reaction was, we should try that shit. Usually, I'm up for anything, but this time, I'm a bit dubious. I can't ima imagine what the reaction would be. One thing is certain though, most people, they want to eat the deliciously cooked flesh carved from a freshly slaughtered mammal as long as there's nothing that reminds them it's an animal. But I won't hold the fucking boys back. If there's something they want to try, go ahead, go crazy. After all, the best discoveries are hidden somewhere in between all the insanity. There's one thing though, that we can be very, very, very clear about. I think so hideous, it should never be mentioned again. Dried brains. It's off the charts, absolutely disgusting. In fact, there are not enough words in any vocabulary to explain it thoroughly. We thought it would be like bacon. <laughs> At least that was the idea. A thin slice cooked until crisp. We were so certain it would work and we're already considering what to accompany the newly discovered chips with. But it was horrifying. <laughs> The only time I've been more revolted when I saw a young kid on a beach putting his finger up his ass. <laughs> only to taste it seconds later. Un unfortunately, that's a real story. I'm sure he's growing up to achieve greatness. <laughs> Nonetheless, we are definitely going ahead with the brain spread. Perhaps smoked. This was a, a good example of many entries that deals with failure. It's a, it's a simple word to say failure, but it's so fucking hard to deal with, you know? Especially when you, in a kitchen like ours, deal with this sort of element of surprise. It's also another simple word to, to say, but so difficult to obtain and to do each time. Surprise people. And before I wrote the journal, I used to let these failures get to us, get to me. I thought something was wrong with me. And I thought I had the wrong team. I thought we were all like a bunch of idiots. And sometimes it would be so bad I would sort of push us into some sort of collective melancholy. You know, we're standing in a corner, all the pierced, tattooed boys and girls feeling totally inadequate of themselves. And then I, I, I went back to the journal. And I read it a few times and I could see that if we're not failing, it means that we're not pushing hard enough. You grew up as a cook sort of uh, believing that you are a martyr. There was years when I was okay with that. You know, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go full on. What if you die, I thought to myself. Okay, so be it. It was so crazy. <laughs> you know, we, you do years and years of like, and, and suddenly you, 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 you lose the fun. And we actually stopped having fun. And in order for us to have fun at the restaurant, you know, I did some huge changes at the place here. The Mad Symposium is a sort of a, an idea that's been ruminating in me for a while. Are you ready for that, three? Yeah. This idea of making sense of our trade, where are we right now? And so I thought, let's have a meeting ground for that. Let's open up, let's talk about things, let's step out of the norm, share ideas, let's meet new people, let's do this. My family have been butchered for 250 years. I believe we have to play around here like we have nothing to lose. I like that.
I do not plan ahead in terms of 10 years from now. I'm more happy, but you know, we, we, we fool around like it could be our last year. So this little clip here was from the MAD symposium. MAD, MAD means food in Danish. And I had thought about this for a while, about having a sort of a, a place that's made by chefs, for chefs, a symposium where we could meet and, and talk about what's going on in our very, 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 very insane trade. And the reason why I started doing this is because I was thinking back to when I started as a cook. I was 15 years old and, um, you know, I wanted to be a cook and I was thinking, what can this lead to? I knew that I was going to be in a basement somewhere and I was going to get cuts everywhere. And then, and this is the truth, my biggest aspiration, my biggest hope was maybe one day somebody would come along as being the son of an immigrant and a cleaning lady, that somebody would come along and sponsor me so I could have like a three and a half cover restaurant and then support myself. Like being here in front of all you, there was like no way. <laughs> it was just, you didn't even dream it because it was just never going to happen. You were destined for the basement, breathing in toxic fumes. Your biggest aspiration was maybe, you know, to become a better alcoholic than the one before you. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did this mad symposium and boy, has it been a success. And there is something going on. Our trade is changing. Suddenly, restaurant <laughs> cooks are sort of invited into pop culture. And and we are sort of the first generation who's filtering all this new info and it's very, very, very strange and difficult to understand when you're sort of a, a child of the old world going into the new world of being a cook. And so I'm going to read a little entry of this so that uh, you can understand how crazy it was. This is from the second day of the symposium. We had uh, never d done this before. We didn't know what we were doing. And we didn't know that on the first day in the morning, one of the worst storms would sort of fly in over Copenhagen. And we had decided to put a symposium in a circus tent. Not because we wanted to be cool about it, but because the circus season was over and it was cheap. <laughs> and when, when we showed up on day one, everything had fallen to the ground, the whole tent. It was like fucking chaos everywhere. But you know what happens? Fucking restaurant trade happens, they're just going to get the job done. So I'm going to read to you a little bit of, a little segment from day two out of many entries about the Mad Symposium. Sunday 28th of August. How'd everybody sleep, I asked. Fucking amazing, chef. We're so pumped for today. So am I, answered, and we stood for a minute or so just enjoying the coffee, the light breeze, and the morning sky. I broke the silence trying to start the day's briefing. Guys, let's just do what we did yesterday. But then I was interrupted. We have a big problem, the toilets aren't working, Ali stuttered with a roll of toilet paper in his hand. What the fuck you done to them, one of the guys joked. Peter broke in. Mud and rain is, is one thing, but nowhere to shit, that's a fucking issue. <laughs> I actually think he was trying to be serious, but everyone burst out laughing. What's a toilet against the elements, I thought to myself. I'll handle it, Peter said. Now let's get ready. The word about the symposium had burst across Copenhagen yesterday, and today even more people flooded in, the tent bulging with guests, filling up the stairs, the empty spaces in front of the stage, every last nook and cranny occupied. It was boiling, steamy, seething with people, and the noise and energy of such a big crowd packed into the little tent was insane. It puzzles me how effortlessly the talks have gone, as initially that was my biggest worry. Sure, there's been hiccups. The sound went, the DVD player malfunctioned, stuff like that, small things. But a real story has been told about the natural world, how it works, how you cook it, issues it faces, historical perspectives and the question of its future. It was a strong narrative from the first speaker, science writer, Tornartanas, to Peruvian chef Gaston Acurio's dynamic conclusion today. I particularly enjoyed Brazilian chef Alex Atala's talk. He came up on stage, put his two hands to his chest and said, my name is Alex Atala. I ask you, 
Why don't we eat insects? Something happened to me as I stood and listened in silence, eagerly awaiting his next words. He paused for a good 15 seconds, allowing people to reflect on this question, and then started passing out what looked like little candies. I looked closely. They were no bigger than sugar cubes, but in the center of each one was a fucking huge Amazonian ant. Around the room, people were giggling, giggling nervously as if telling themselves, this is a joke, right? I put it in my mouth and started chewing, letting the flavors grow until a powerful hit of lemongrass filled my whole mouth. But in a new and different way that wasn't exactly like eating that familiar plant. Yeah, why don't we eat insects? I thought. These flavors are too good to miss. There were so many moments like this throughout the day where presenters spoke on new and original ideas, but the fact that in under 30 minutes I changed my perspective and was thinking, bugs, why the fuck not? <laughs> was worth the whole symposium. <laughs> One little seed planted, a new inspiration, a new layer to our work, which reminds me of the title of Italian chef Massimo Bottura's talk, We Should Never Stop Planting. It feels weird now, Ali told me as we looked at all the guests eating at the after party. Something's missing. I should be happy, but I'm depressed. It's over. I knew exactly what he was talking about. The last three days have been so insane, filled with every emotion known to man. I gave him a little shake and smile. Why are you depressed, my friend? I had this huge sense of accomplishment. He shrugged his shoulders. I'm going to get drunk, walking towards the bar. It was turning out to be a real party now, with people shoving chairs out the way and voices loud, happy, and slurred. As I quietly walked away, I told myself, I got to get some sleep. On Tuesday, Michel Bois is eating with us. Yeah. Gonna pick up here, Johnny? You know, I've been trained to believe that there is a head chef and he's sort of the despot of the kitchen. The number one ruler. That's the way it's always been. That's the way I was trained. That is something that I don't want in my place. Okay. Come on, guys. The Saturday Night Project was a, a sort of reaction against that. It was sort of a, the anti-robotic chef move. It is a training camp for, for intuition and, and the sharpening of our sensibilities. Yeah, if they served me this in a three-star restaurant, I would, uh, wouldn't blink. You know. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have um, pig's ears here. They've been cooked for about 12 hours now. So I have two presentations. That I, I call it the grotesque one because it's just plain ear. You can see the ear channel and everything, but that's my favorite because you can actually identify your favorite part of the ear. <laughs> Wait okay, okay, okay. Can I ask if there's any other in this room right now, currently, that has a favorite part of the year? No. <laughs> no? Pigs here. Not every year. And over here we have it um, just slightly chopped. They're all being caramelized a little bit. There you go. Enjoy. Okay. Fatty, juicy, cartilage part of the pig ear. Here you go. Yeah. Wow. Well, Shit. That. <laughs> That's really, really, really good. That's a dangerous bowl. Yeah. For how many of you is the first time you ever eat in the year? How many is the first time that you like an ear? I gotta put my hands up on that one. Actually, I've never really enjoyed eating ear. <laughs> This is so good, huh? like so good, huh? Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. even the Spanish guy says yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's clear up. Who's next? Beef tartare. We've been aging for 21 days in the fridge upstairs. How many love this dish? No. Why not? Very tasty, but um, I think we could use a bit of sharpness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. In this case, I really like it's very pure, but I think it would be even purer, and even more sharp and sort of clear in the dressing if you had 
worked it a bit more together. But definitely fucking good. 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 Thanks, Henry. All right, who's next? All right, what do you have for us, Mina? Um, I wanted to do something with apples and hazelnuts and kale. A kale dessert. All right. Mm. Well, that's a first for anything. All right, so every time you, we taste something that we never had before, it's oh, you always really, you should always expect like a reaction. Yeah, no, you put yourself on the limb, huh? yeah. because you could have made a caramel ice cream with raisins and everybody would have cheered right now, but you choose a cabbage dessert. So that's really putting yourself out there. You, you are, are totally challenging everything that people think about dessert-wise. <laughs> um, so having that said, how many like this dish? Chef, <clears throat> you got guts, like super guts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, five years ago, kale was like horse food, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> seriously, it's only in the last three years that people actually started eating kale around the world. And now it's in desserts. Because of you. That's cool. Let's work more on it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's clean up. <clears throat> Go up and change, and then drink your beers. This uh, clip was from something that we call the Saturday Night Projects that we've been doing, well, more or less since we opened. And as you can see, it's a crazy place. Now, imagine that we, you go through a 90-hour work week and you had the Super Bowl semi-final for lunch and for dinner. That's what you're playing five days a week. There's no friendly matches or anything, it's there. And then on Saturday, when, once it's all done, it's two o'clock in the morning, then the pressure starts. Then people take out the thing that they've been thinking about, like cabbage dessert. I realize though that the three years of eating cab kale around the world doesn't really apply here to San Francisco. <laughs> but <laughs> you're sort of the forefront in, in the kale movement. <laughs> yeah, be proud of that. And, um, and so I did this as a place to sort of see if I could shake up this robotic chefness that I was experiencing a lot of cooks having as they started, even myself, to, to tell the truth, when you opened up. But we were in this type of kitchen where the ingredients came in all the time. A good example is, you know, you have the strawberry one week, it's amazing. Next week, from the same farm, not so much. Now imagine 400 ingredients coming in through, throughout the day sometimes, from the tiniest little herb to a big animal, and it's like that. They're different each day. You can't have robots. You need the sensibilities intact. In you, you know, people that don't follow blindly recipes. So we did that. And I can tell you, it fucking works. It's just amazing. It's amazing to see and have yet to see anybody that spent more than two years with us that doesn't go from being very, very, very sort of afraid of putting themselves out there to finishing masterpiece after masterpiece after masterpiece. It's just amazing. And then I went back to the journal and I read it and then I could see that uh, the, the Saturday Night Projects had, had given us something else as well. Something that I, that I had never been told was a part of any kitchen. You know, in between the, the blisters and the sores and the maniac hours and the shouting sometimes and screaming and ingredients and dead animals and carcasses, the Saturday Night Projects sort of added the glue which was fun in between. And that was a new word for me, for a kitchen. Thursday the 23rd of June. I spent the whole day in the test kitchen. We decided to step away from the cucumber dessert for a while. 
We need to raise the mood. My gut's telling me that the team can deal with more failures. That's another mysterious thing, failure, and how to deal with it. A group of young, eager cooks from around the world can feel so broken by lack of progress. You try out an idea, it doesn't work, you feel disappointed. You have a new idea that doesn't work either, and so it continues until eventually something is achieved. But most of the time, one idea takes days of trial and error, and I guess the real key to success is how you handle the period from the beginning to the very end. You can actually see it in people's eyes. At first, there's a sparkle as they eagerly tell the team about the thing they've been thinking of. It's something personal. It takes guts to share it. Everyone wonders, am I good enough? But with the right team, you can build a an atmosphere of confidence and trust in which each member feels secure enough to put themselves out there. But still, when the end result isn't working, you see disappointment, maybe even fear, because after all, not trying is always the easiest thing to do. It's not surprising then when their eyes go dull and like a newspaper press, one moment they're filled with noise and roaring production, and the next moment, when somebody switches them off, the mechanism stalls to a halt, Silence. It's a shame. What do you think, Thomas? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Tuesday the 1st of November, and if there's any Irish people out there, I excuse myself beforehand. I've been waiting like a child for this day, Trevor exclaimed in a very, very, very fat Irish accent. The news quickly spread through the kitchen, they're here, everyone shouted to each other, leaving their half filleted fish on cutting boards and running to the test kitchen. Come on, Trevor. Rosier said as he peeled layer after layer of tape off the package, open the fucking box already. With a final wrench, he pulled the top off and we all peered down at the little plastic container swarming with ants. Trevor was the first to dare. He took a live ant and popped it in his mouth. We all watched wide-eyed in silence as he chewed, registering every little thing that happened in his mouth. It took him two or three seconds to go from skeptical and concentrated to convinced and excited. Oh my God, he said. They're so strong, holy shit, they taste like a lemongrass. <laughs> All around him, people were starting to giggle and chatter. Isn't it bitter? One person asked, did it make you gag? Trevor picked up another one. No, they're really good, we're onto something. <laughs> Everyone's hands collided as we all reached for a taste. And as I was staring an ant in the eyes, the little head wriggling and the legs moving around vigorously, I told myself, this is a shrimp. <laughs> Think of it as a shrimp. It's prettier than a shrimp. I placed it on my tongue and it immediately started to run around my mouth, tickling. <laughs> At that point, I could already taste the lemongrass. I gave it a gentle chew, and then the explosion came. A burst of citrus and ginger as well, or lovage, or maybe the perfect mixture of all three. My mind isn't made up yet, but it's definitely like nothing I've ever tasted in my life. Wednesday, 2nd November. Trevor served the first few for lunch. Beforehand, we'd agreed that while we were describing the herb garden bouquets to the table, we would convertly add the crème with ants. Almost as if it was an afterthought so that the guests could have a small moment of discovery. A couple in their 40s came in very well dressed and sophisticated, asking those kind of questions you ask when you clearly dined out quite a bit. Perfect test subjects. Trevor went down to the table, holding the bouquets in one hand, the other slightly cupped, concealing the main attraction. He presented the small bouquet, chatty and joking, his Irish humor in full swing, and then he did a little magic trick. 
slipping the creme fraiche onto the table, while distracting the unsuspecting couple with the other hand, pointing at the bouquet and gesturing enthusiastically in explanation. After a split second, the lady discovered our rouse, her eyes fluttering and her jaw literally dropping. And she began patting her husband's arm firmly, trying to gesture with her head as she stared down at the plate of creme fraiche with ants. Her husband pursed his lips, a bit irritated to, de to be disturbed in, in the middle of such an engaging narration and just briefly glanced down, not wanting to be impolite to Trevor. It took half a second for his brain to register what he was looking at and then his eyes were fully and completely fixed on the plate of creme fraiche with ants. <laughs> and at that exact moment, exact moment, Trevor, he said, Please go ahead and dip the herbs in the creme fraiche spiced with ants. <laughs> now, when we present food, there's always the usual immediate confidence. Yeah, huh? sure, yes, something like that. Here, silence. <laughs> Five seconds went by. Are you okay? Trevor questioned politely, his eyes twinkling. Are there supposed to be ants in the food? The man asked bravely. Don't worry, they're delicious, go for it. <laughs> it was pure pleasure to watch the couple eat this plate of food to observe how they discovered the flavor and had a completely new experience. Ever since that day, we've had ants on the menu. In many shapes and forms, and we've had plenty of other bugs on the menu too. But it started with the ant. When we first put it on the menu, it was crazy though, because, ooh, the press went crazy, like full on. They attacked us for no apparent reason. They thought it was like a joke. Without even having tested them, they always said it was a problem, that ants were on the menu. Then the sort of international press came along, chimed in, wanting to be a part of the fun games. But the most crazy thing, it was actually, uh, one of my one of my friends, he his girlfriend had just left him, and so he was sitting and staring at those boring television shows in the afternoon where you can watch Parliament talk to each other. <laughs> you know? And and then uh, you know at one point one of these people stand up and says to everybody in the room like we need to discuss the Noma ants. So it was a it became a thing like in Parliament. <laughs> Like it was insane. But the worst moment was when a big time, big time New York chef, he's also known as the panda chef, maybe you can get who he is. He called me up and he said, dude, man, everybody's making fun of you. And that was sort of a moment where I was like, okay, shit. Even the chefs, the ones that, like my friends, the one that always searching for flavors, they're making fun of it without even having tasted it. I thought, no fucking way. Chefs are not like that. So I called up, well, I needed a bit of tenderness. So I decided to call up Alex Atala because after all, he was the motherfucker who put this in my head at the mad symposium. <laughs> <laughs> and I called him up, and this is a true story. I called him up, and he says, Oh, hi, Alex Tala. And then, uh, <laughs> and I said, Alex, are you proud of me? I have put ants on the menu. And then there's sort of an awkward silence. And he says, Really? <laughs> I don't. I could never have that in Sao Paulo. People would kill me here. It's just one of those crazy moments. Now, of course, it's totally flipped. Now people want the ants on the menu. In three years, you know, from this issue with Parliament to now everybody sort of wanted it somehow. It, it doesn't, the normal experience isn't right if they, I didn't get the bug. <laughs> I'm gonna read to you one more entry. Um, just to finish it off, I hope you've by now got a feel for what's happening and the tone of things in the book. And 
I, um, I stopped writing in the journal because I had to, not because I also thought that writing in a journal every night is fucking painful and it is something that is one of the most toughest thing I've ever done. You know, I wake up in the morning and I cook porridge for my kids and I try to sort of discipline and then I do the lunch, lunch box and then I, go to, then I go to work and it's discipline and then you go home at night and you just want a beer. You don't want to sit in front of the screen and be disciplined, you know, and just waiting for the words to come out. But I had to stop writing it, not because of, because of that, but because we were in a very, very critical situation. I had spent that year just trying to get a new sort of vibe for the team. And um, so I had lost track of, of the financial situation of our restaurant. And we almost went bankrupt. Now, usually this happens a few times a year, but, <laughs> but this time was very serious. Like it was really, 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 really serious. So I had to stop and sort of focus a bit on, on like saving everything. And it's so true. What all of you that are not cooks, everything you hear about those type of restaurants, it's true. The amount you think of in your head, take half away. Then you have the real amount of just how little it is. So I stopped and then I went back to it. I thought, okay, I took this with me to my vacation and I, and I, and I, and I read it several times, the journal. And it was pretty amazing actually to read it again. And then when I came back from the journal, I wrote the final entry. I thought it needed some sort of conclusion. And it's a fairly long final entry. So I'm go just going to read a little bit of it. Monday, the 6th of February, 2012. It's mind-boggling to think of all the insane hours we wasted on speculating about damning and fearing the weather. Instead of welcoming it as an enormously important creative catalyst, shaping the restaurant we become. During spring, we're like young fowls running around like it's our first days on grass. Our thoughts flow freely and the seeds of our best ideas are planted. Here, we unleash our intuition, delving in the, in the diversity of colors and textures. With almost too much to fully process, we surrender to the flavors. During summer, we nurture these ideas. We bring our intuition in and bring some of them to life. Autumn always offers some of our best moments. There, we cull the bounty of the season, the big harvest just before the sucker punch of the long, dark, cold months. Finally, winter, where things percolate, where we process and digest what just happened over the year. This cycle is who we are. It's shaped into our DNA, and with each passing year becomes a layer richer, like a tree. Come to think of it, I can, I can recall the weather on every good and bad moment we've had over the last year. Take the day Genta. My second child was born. There was a mild breeze with some scattered showers. <laughs> and I remember wondering if these conditions would be good for wild mushrooms. <laughs> or the night that the legendary Michel Bras ate at Noma. It was a fairly cold late summer's evening, about 12 degrees, but inside the kitchen it was fucking boiling. Then there was a day when the seed of this journal was planted. It was one bleak, typically Danish winter's morning, when the icy winds were howling against the window panes, and Nadine worriedly asked me, Are you okay? I hope you enjoyed the book.